Okay, great. And we're live. And hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's Intech. And welcome to today's webinar. Thank you all for taking a moment to join while people are joining here. I uh, just want to do a couple of things at the very top of the presentation here. Um, one of the things we're going to do is provide a um, PDF of today's uh, PowerPoint for folks to download. If uh, you all will be able to see a Google Drive link that my co-host will post into um, into the uh, chat where you all can easily get access to a PDF version of this uh, PowerPoint that we'll have available here. And then we will also uh, have a closed captioning here that I'm bringing up for folks. Uh, for any individuals who are joining us who may be deaf or hard of hearing, please note that we will have the option for individuals to access uh, closed captioning for today's event. So shortly, you should be able to see a uh, media um, file um, or a media application to appear in your um, panel there. And if you select that, it should give you the option to where you will be able to uh, access the closed captioning for today's presentation. You'll just simply select uh, continue to server, I believe, there, and then you'll see the live captioning um, appearing on your screen there at the bottom of your uh, your control panel there. You'll see the live captioning there. Great. All right. Uh, so other than that, it is a little bit after two and more folks are joining us. Welcome to those who are uh, coming on. Uh, with that being said, we'll go ahead and begin today's um, presentation. So again, welcome everyone to the first webinar in our webinar series on uh, preventing youth hate crimes, introduction to youth hate crimes and hate groups. My name is William Moore. I'm with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. And before we get started with today's web event, I'd like to go through a couple of housekeeping items to keep in mind. Please note that today's web event is being recorded and will be published on OJJDP's multimedia page. You can find past webinar events archived on OJJDP's multimedia page. If you would like to get access to any supporting materials related to any of the webinars that you see on OJJDP's multimedia page, please reach out to the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. Uh, just a couple of quick tips. If you're having any issues downloading the uh, event materials, which is a PDF of today's web event, then please be sure to click on the Google Drive link that my co-host will post inside of the uh, chat here, where you can easily uh, click on the link there and get access to it. Um, and actually, let me really quickly go to my host and make sure that you all can get access that. Uh, Alicia, my apologies. Let me make you a panelist so that you can uh, <laughs> you can send that out to people. Um, Alicia, you're a panelist now, so you're able to send that uh, link out to the audience now. My apologies there. So again, shortly, uh, audience, my um, co-host Alicia Lord will be sending you all a um, link where you can easily get access to the PDF version of this presentation so that you can have access to those links, those resources, and our presenters' bios. For optimal audio, please note that we would like for you to please have the WebEx system dial a phone line uh, by selecting the Call Me At feature. There you can enter in your phone number. And then when you select join the event, you'll be able to join and you'll see a connection either through a phone or a headset to indicate that you are indeed um, joined with today's event. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during today's webinar, please reach out uh, through a private message to me and I'll be more than happy to assist you. All right. 
So to ask a question during today's webinar, we are asking for folks to utilize the chat window. Please note that all participants have come in on mute. Uh, you can utilize the chat window in order to send any questions that you have to our panelists during the Q&A portion of today's web event. Prior to sending your question, please be sure to select all panelists. Again, prior to sending your question to our panelists, please be sure to select all panelists in the two field prior to sending your question. So we'll get a quick practice of that here. Um, if you can right now, go to your window. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to do anything at this time. However, if you're viewing with additional people, more than one person, please go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. So if it's yourself and your uh, program manager, then you would put plus one in the chat to indicate the additional people that are in the room with you today. So go to the chat, select all panelists, and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. Also, a quick poll question for everyone. Um, I'm going to open up a quick poll where I'm going to ask folks uh, just a really quick poll for you to all to take um, while we're opening up today's web event. And we basically want to know, what's your current knowledge of today's um, topic area in, as it revolves to uh, youth hate crimes and hate groups? So you also see a poll that will pop up in your control panel. Please take a moment to indicate um, how you would rate your current knowledge. Um, of today's subject matter. All right. Please note that attendees will receive a certificate of attendance within 24 hours of the conclusion of today's web event via a automated email from OJJDP's um, intact uh, through WebEx. So please be sure to keep an eye out on your email for your certificate. Here's a rundown of today's agenda. And now I will turn it over to Steffi Rapp to welcome us and set uh, the tone for today's webinar. Steffi, take it away. Thank you, William. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the first webinar in our 12-part series titled An Introduction to Hate Crimes and Hate Groups. My name is Steffi Rapp, and I'm a program manager at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and a member of the StopBullying.gov editorial board, as well as a member of the Federal Partners in Bullying Prevention. Today, you will hear from some amazing experts in the field. First, you'll hear from Michael Lieberman, who is from the Southern Poverty Law Center's Senior Policy Council in Washington, with a focus on countering hate and extremism. He joined SPLC in May of 2020 after serving as the Anti-Defamation League's Washington Council for the previous 30 years, leading ADL's federal advocacy and legislative lawyering, lawyering work on civil rights, religious freedom, and hate crime prevention. Michael received his BA from the University of Michigan and a law degree from Duke University. <clears throat> Next, we will hear from Rick Eaton. Rick Eaton is the Director of Research at the Simon Wiesenthal Center. As co-director of the Center's Digital Terrorism and Hate Project, he has supervised the production of all 23 editions of the Digital Hate Digital Terrorism and Hate Interactive Report. Rick regularly meets with Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, and other social networking companies to give feedback and assist in shaping policy. Rick has worked extensively with California Peace Officer Standards and Training and has been a subject matter expert on 11 educational telecourses produced by POST and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Rick has twice testified in congressional hearings and conducted many briefings on Capitol Hill. Next, we will hear from Dr. James Densley. James Densley is a professor and department chair of criminal justice at Metropolitan State University and co-founder of the Violence Project Research Center, best known for its National Institute of Justice funded mass shooter database. James has received global media attention for his work on street gangs, criminal networks, violence, and policing. He's the author of seven books, including the acclaimed The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. 
50 peer-reviewed articles in leading scientific journals, and over 80 book chapters, essays, and other work in outlets such as the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. James is a former middle school special education teacher and earned his doctorate in sociology from the University of Oxford. And last but not least, we'll hear from Dr. Jillian Peterson. Dr. Peterson is a former psychologist, is a forensic, sorry, she's not former, she's a forensic psychologist, professor of criminology at Hamline University, and previous investigator on death penalty cases in New York City. She's the co-author of the newly released, highly acclaimed book, The Violence Project, How to Stop the Mass Shooting Epidemic, based on four years of in-depth research into the lives of mass shooters. Um, James and Jillian work together. She's the co-founder and co-president of The Violence Project, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research center dedicated to reducing violence using research and analysis. Dr. Peterson holds an MA and PhD from the University of California, Irvine. She's a regular media commentator in outlets such as the New York Times, National Public Radio, CNN, and the Washington Post. Okay, and now I will turn it over to Michael to start us off. Thanks, Steffi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Lieberman. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, thanks to OJJDP for involving me and the Southern Poverty Law Center in this webinar. James, Jill, Rick, it's great to share a platform together. I hope folks are familiar with the work of the Southern Poverty Law Center. I joined SPLC in May of 2020 after, as Steffi said, 30 years working as the ADL's Washington Council. And one of the best things about SPLC and ADL is that though we work on law and legislation to counter extremism, bullying, hate violence, hate crimes, our principal focus at SPLC and ADL's education, SPLC's Learning for Justice program, which used to be called Teaching Tolerance, is on prevention. It's much better to prevent harassment, intimidation, bullying in schools, and hate violence than to respond to it afterwards. You may know SPLC from our work um, in the annual Year in Hate and Extremism report. Um, I know Rick will be focusing on hate groups in his presentation following mine. Um, the SPLC defines hate groups as an organization whose beliefs and practices attack or malign entire classes of people simply because of their personal characteristics. In 2020, our most recent Year in Hate and Extremism report, SPLC tracked 838 active hate groups throughout the United States. This map is on our website. It's important to know when you're thinking about bullying, intimidation, harassment, the vast majority of hate crimes are not committed by members of organized hate groups. To address the problem of hate violence in schools or elsewhere, we have to know how many there are. And since 1991, the FBI has been collecting hate crime data from the nation's 18,000 federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies. Data drives policy, and our data is not very good. This is an incredibly small chart, but you can be comforted by the fact that you'll be able to download a PDF of it afterwards and the fact that this particular chart is on the ADL's uh, website. Um, but I would just call your attention to those who have really good eyes to the top left of this chart. And you can see in 2020 um, that there were 15,138 participating agencies. And participating means that they reported zero or reported one or more hate crimes. And since there are more than 18,000 police departments, already we see that there are 3,500 police department jurisdictions that have disappeared. They did not report any data to the FBI at all. Um, 2,389 of them reported one or more hate crime. That means that 86% of even the participating agencies are affirmatively telling the FBI that they had zero hate crimes in, 20, in 2020. 
And the third number down is 8,263 hate crimes, the highest number of hate crimes, as we'll see from the um, charts that I'll roll out um, since 2001. Uh, this is the total number of hate crimes reported. 8,000 is a third straight year of increase, a 13% increase over the 2019 numbers, and the most since 2001. These are not SPLC data. This is not ADL data. It's not Simon Wiesenthal Center data. It's the FBI data, and it's the crimes that are voluntarily reported to the FBI by local law enforcement. Reporting hate crimes to the FBI, as I mentioned, is voluntary. All crime reporting to the FBI is voluntary. This is another incredibly small chart, um, but you can see that there are 69 cities. This chart is also available on your PDF, but it's also on the ADL website. And 69 cities, over 100,000 in population, either did not report at all, 10 cities over 100,000 did not report any data, or affirmatively reported that they had zero hate crimes to the FBI. That is just not credible. Here's a bar graph that talks about participating agencies versus reporting agencies. And again, 18,000 is the total number of agencies. About 15,000 are participating and way down the orange bar is the number that are reporting one or more hate crimes. Hate crime motivation by percentage every year since 1991, race-based crimes, that's the highest bar on this bar graph, um, have been the most numerous, then religion, um, and then sexual orientation. This is a pie chart of the breakdown of hate crimes reported to the FBI. You can see that the uh, plurality of them are uh, race or ethnicity based. The FBI disaggregated juvenile hate crimes only beginning in 2015, and you can see disturbingly the number of juvenile hate crime incidents over those five years has increased. The number of perpetrators um, is also disturbingly high. In fact, juveniles are disproportionately both victims and perpetrators of hate crime. Um, that is disturbing. This is a pie chart that talks about adults versus juveniles in terms of the number of hate crimes. I'm just drilling down a little bit. Anti-Muslim incidents, um, 110 in 2020. That's on the far left-hand side. But look at 2000, 28 anti-Muslim hate crimes reported in the entire country in the year 2000 and 481 in 2001 after the attacks of 9-11, a 17 100% increase and a, um, the highest number ever. And the numbers thankfully have decreased since then because of law enforcement, educational outreach, that's been very important. The anti-Jewish incidents um, down appreciably in 2020, but disturbingly, anti-Jewish incidents have always been, since 2001, between 50 and 80% of the number of religion-based hate crimes reported to the FBI. If you're talking about 2.5% of the population, 55% in 2020 of the uh, religion-based hate crimes, that's a very disturbing figure. Anti-Hispanic hate crimes, it's, this is one of the reasons why hate crime data is so important. In eras of tremendous polarization and anti-immigrant sentiment, we see that dramatically reflected in increases in anti-Hispanic hate crimes. It's also reflected in the disturbingly large increase in the anti-AAPI uh, hate crimes, Asian American Pacific Islander hate crimes. Um, 2020 was the largest number of uh, anti-AAPI crimes ever. And do you think, um, rhetorical question, that there's a connection between the very polarizing rhetoric, Wuhan flu, Kung flu, um, blaming COVID-19 pandemic on AAPI communities and the number of hate crimes. Absolutely, there is a connection. Um, and last, uh, the, a very disturbing number of crimes against people on the basis of their gender and gender identity. The FBI began collecting 
this data, this particular data only in 2013, but in 2020, 3% of the total number of hate crimes in the country are crimes directed against people on the basis of their gender identity. If you think about how that community is marginalized and do not trust the police as a general matter to report and to be 3% of all hate crimes, very disturbing. I think it's weird for a civil rights lawyer to say that the FBI hate crime data collection guidelines and training manual is the best hate crime data collection guidelines and training manual on the planet, but it is. And the reason that it is, is because the FBI worked in partnership with the National Center for Transgender Equality and the ABL and the SPLC and the Human Rights Campaign, the Asian, the Asian American Justice Center, American Association of University Women, Seek American Legal Defense and Education Fund, a number of civil rights groups to talk about how to write this manual, which is about an 80 page manual. It's available on the FBI website. I commend it to you. Um, it's a very useful and important document. Hate crime laws are a blunt instrument in responding to hate crimes, but they are very important as well. This is a chart, again, incredibly small, that is available on the ADL website um, of every hate crime law in the country. 46 states in the District of Columbia have hate crime laws. The four states that don't, Arkansas, Indiana, South Carolina, and Wyoming. But even the states that don't have hate crime laws report data or should report data to the FBI. That's what the hate crime data collection guidelines talk about. Um, this chart is um, on the ADL website. This is a picture of Matthew Shepard. He was a 21-year-old University of Wyoming student killed in October of 1998 because he was gay. And this is a picture of James Byrd Jr., a 49-year-old Jasper, Texas resident who was murdered because he was black in June of 1998. The most important federal hate crime law is the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. This is the page that it starts on um, in uh, the only law that has passed Congress every year for the past 61 years. It's the Department of Defense Authorization Act. This most important hate crime enforcement law is included as Division E of the fiscal year 2010 Department of Defense authorization law, because that's the only way that advocates could get it passed. For 13 years, we worked on this legislation and it was blocked for 13 years because of the inclusion of two words that recur throughout this law, sexual orientation. The idea that people could be dead, bloody, beaten because of their sexual orientation for 13 years, the Bush administration at the time, and Congress um, refused to move this bill forward, and only in 2009 did it pass, but only as part of the Department of Defense authorization law. As I've said, law is not enough. We cannot outlaw hate. Prevention is the key. And here I want to encourage folks to take a look at um, resources that are on the SPLC website, and also at the American University Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab. We affectionately call them PARAL. Um, that's how they call themselves too. But we have work um, with them on online radicalization to help prevent hate crime, to help prevent bullying. This guide that um, is on our website for parents and caregivers um, is, um, is something that can really make a difference. It's about building resilience. It's about recognizing danger signs for parents and about ways to successfully intervene um, when those danger signs are present for our children and the people that we are um, helping to mentor. And second, the very, very extensive resources on the SPLC's website, the Learning for Justice website, <clears throat> this is the front page of reimagining digital literacy education. Um, that is one of the keys to addressing disinformation, to be able to build critical thinking skills. I know Jill and James are going to be talking more about that. 
Um, but I hope folks will take a look at these resources. And one more that Steffi already mentioned in passing, the stopbullying.gov. It is an exceptionally useful uh, Department of Education website. Not only does it have good resources to prevent bullying, but it has every single one of the 51 American laws about preventing bullying. Um, it's very, every one of you comes from a state that has a bullying prevention law. It's important that those laws be implemented. They're not about punitive measures. They're about education, reporting, appropriate discipline, very important. So let me end and turn it over to Rick with thanks to OJJDP and thanks to all of you for participating. Need the slide deck. Rick, if you um, are, you have control of the slide there. If you um, <clears throat> go to the control panel and press the arrow down, you should be able to move along to your next slide there. There okay. we go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as was as uh, Steffi said, I'm I'm the uh, director of research at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, and uh, we uh, we uh, uh, have have uh, been around since 1977. We're named for the Holocaust survivor turned Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal, who was responsible for the uh, uh, location and capture of nearly 1,100 uh, war criminals after World War II. And we also operate the Museum of Tolerance uh, and have uh, tens of thousands of, of students and others that come to the me museum on a regular basis. Now, I will, I just want to warn you here that that uh, uh, my job is really to get down in the mud with with uh, uh, people that promote hate. And as Michael said, the, the vast majority of, of hate crimes are, are not committed by members of hate groups, but unfortunately, these groups and now websites and other other locations online uh, do uh, do influence a lot of these actions. So uh, that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some disturbing material, so I'll apologize in advance. Uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be coming up on uh, 36 years and doing this work. When I started it, we didn't have uh, uh, computers, much less uh, 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 online resources. So my job was to subscribe to publications like these. And this is how we kept track of what a lot of these groups were up to over the years. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about history for a minute, because for about for about 40, 50 years, uh, the the uh, hate movements in this country were really easy to identify. You knew who the players were. You knew what they were about. You had some. These are just a few of the major figures. There were others, but uh, especially the two guys on the ends, William Pierce, a former professor at, at Oregon State, and Richard Butler of Aryan Nations, who was an engineer with Lockheed, uh, were two of the most prominent. Uh, and uh, they died a couple of years apart. Tom Metzger ran uh, White Aryan Resistance here in California, uh, got old, just passed away last year. And Matt Hale, as you see, uh, a younger guy who was appealing to youth was uh, uh, is now in jail for 40 years. But these, these uh, kind of traditional groups dominated the scene for a long time until you had all these people leave, and from about 2005 to 2015, the there was not uh, there was not much leadership in the extremist movements. And what happened is that you had a younger generation come along, led by people like uh, uh, Richard Spencer the, of the National Policy Institute, and. Uh, they were younger. They were internet savvy. They called themselves the alt right. They got uh, 
online. They got very involved in the in the campaign of 2016, and we started hearing about uh, all this hate from from younger people. And they they ran the gamut from people in suits and ties to outright neo Nazis. Uh, you see, the National Policy Institute there uh, uh, is an organization dedicated to the heritage, identity, and future of people of European descent in the United States. If you read that closely, that's all you need to know about, uh, about this particular group, where they're coming from. But uh, they, they, uh, uh, they try to keep it masked and they, they don't use, uh, uh, for the most part, you know, a lot of the outright symbols that we might, we might uh, associate with extremist groups. Uh, and as I said, they, they run the gamut down to outright neo-Nazis, such as Andrew Anglin, who published the Daily Stormer. Uh, he also published this alt-right FAQ, or Frequently Asked Questions. And what he said was that these are all these different groups that are associated with, with what we call the alt-right. So you had the conspiracy theorists, such as Alex Jones, who as you may have heard, just lost uh, a major suit in uh, over the uh, the school shootings in Connecticut, which he claimed were, were fake up at Sandy Hook. Uh, the old white nationalist movement, identitarian movements, kind of this uh, youth movement, kind of a third position, didn't associate with extremist groups, started in Europe, but actually the alt-right was something of an identitarian movement. The troll culture with... Uh, uh, people that were using at the time uh, 4chan, 8chan, which is now 8KUN, and Reddit online, where a lot of the uh, real extremism gets promoted. This is where school shooters and 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 other other shooters will will post their manifestos ahead of time. Uh, something called the manosphere, or uh, people that are guys that are disillusioned with feminism and society. And then also the gamer culture as well, where unfortunately there's a lot of recruiting these days. So that was what they claimed were part of the alt-right. Uh, but they also changed the look. And, and you can see here, in, uh, for example, on the left side there, you see the two pictures of the National Socialist Movement and the guy uh, doing the Hitler salute on the far left there. That's from about eight years ago at a rally, and you see he's got his shield, and uh, you see the, the uh, swastika and the shield, whereas at Charlottesville, they had changed, and they had softened uh, this, this uh, uh, movement. So now they're using here the Odal rune, or, or uh, uh, kind of a symbol of strength, which is uh, many times, not always, but uh, many times associated with the white supremacy movement. Uh, they've for always used the Celtic cross. This is one of the most popular symbols in, in white supremacy, uh, but it's also, a, it's also a symbol that you'll see when you drive by a Catholic church or go to a cemetery. Uh, it's not exclusively a white supremacy symbol. Uh, at Charlottesville, you see this guy carrying a shield that just said nog are nog or enough is enough. Uh, and one of the groups that was at Charlottesville, uh, the traditionalist worker party, you see there, they were uh, trying to reach the, the factory workers and farmers and create this new, uh, new idea culture. So they use this uh, pitchfork inside the cob. Uh, and then another version, they have the, the German Eagle, but instead of a swastika here, you see the pitchfork and the cog down there. And then the German Imperial War flag, which has been used for a long time. This, this was particularly used in Germany where the swastika is illegal. And to the point uh, in the 90s, some of the German states had to outlaw it. But we also see this being used in this country. And I've seen I've seen skinhead concerts where they're flying a swastika flag and they're flying this flag as well. So they're, they're trying to change some of the symbols. Now, in, in, interestingly enough, in the case of NSM, uh, the former leader has left, become a, a spokesman against hate, and the new leader, Bert Colucci, has taken it back to the, uh, to the old days like that with the swastika. Uh, some of the other symbols that you see these days 
uh, that, uh, for example, the big one, Pepe the Frog, which was uh, a, a, uh, a legitimate artist created Pepe the Frog and the alt-right uh, decided that they would appropriate it. And uh, the, the creator uh, at first said that he's just going to retire Pepe the Frog. Uh, and then he, uh, when they continued to use it, then he went out and started suing them. So they changed, they changed the look just slightly to be Groiper. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is still used out there today. You see the skull mask, this, was, this is something that's used by uh, people that was uh, most prominent with a group called Adam Waffen, who was responsible for five murders in this country. Uh, and you see the sun wheel behind him and the sun wheel down here. This is actually a symbol that was used by some Nazis back uh, during the war, but it's used also as a uh, as an alternative to swastikas, and and we see it at various rallies in Europe and also in this country as well. Uh, and a guy, uh, very prominent guy who used it, I'll show you in just a minute. You see again the the German eagle here, but this time with the iron cross. Uh, in the talons as opposed to the swastika. Obviously, the SS bolts are always popular. And the use of the death's head or the Tottenkopf. Uh, you see here, this is, this is very common. Uh, and uh, this has been changed, but this, the, the uh, ID here has in it uh, 1488, which is uh, the 14 words, we must secure the existence of our race and a future for white children or existence of our people, and 88 or HH, the eighth letter of the alphabet, Heil Hitler. Uh, and you'll see these on, on this. These are, for example, Instagram uh, uh, IDs, but you'll also see it on others, email addresses and so forth. You see that 88 or 8814, you really have to uh, uh, think that this you might be have somebody associated with the with the white supremacy movement. So you probably all remember this guy here. Uh, what you may not know is that take a close look at the tattoos that he had. And this one up here uh, is called the Valknut. It's a uh, um, it's associated with with uh, uh, Norse and the and Odinus. Uh, and then down here, he also had a very large hammer of Thor. Now, again, this is a symbol that is not necessarily white supremacist, but a lot of the time when you see it tattooed on someone or you see uh, a guy with a shaved head wearing a hammer of Thor necklace, you kind of get the idea. You're probably somebody that's associated with extremism or white supremacy. Uh, over here on the, on the left, you see that you have... Uh, Besides the uh, cute cat, you have this guy's tattoo with the with the valk nut, or what's also known as the triskelion. If you look inside, you see where it's highlighted here, where it's called three sevens. This is actually a symbol that was used by uh, white supremacist extremists in South Africa. But a lot of the time, when these these symbols are uh, popular with one group somewhere else, they generally make their way to uh, around to uh, white supremacists and, and neo-Nazis in other countries, as you see here, uh, the triple sevens with the SS bolts, and then the, uh, instead of burning a cross or a swastika, they're burning the triple sevens here. One of the other things that they're doing is they have, many of these new, new, new groups have associated themselves with the Crusades and, and uh, this uh, down here on the, the uh, bottom left is a very popular avatar that you see uh, used online that people will use with their IDs with the Crusader, uh, the Crusader soldier with the cross of St. George and, and uh, uh, very common along with, uh, again, this one, the Army of Christ or the Order of the Dragon, which was essentially formed to uh, fight the Ottoman Empire during the Crusades. And of course, when you're associating yourself with Crusaders, you're talking about people that were fighting Muslims. So uh, very, very common and much, much all, every, all the time we see this more and more used. Over here, you see uh, th this one is also common with some of these groups, the uh, 
Molan Le Bay, which is come and take them. The the uh, uh, when the Persians uh, called on the Spartans to throw out their weapons, and they they uh, used this phrase. It said, "Come and take them." Uh, another one is uh, associating with the Crusades is this one, and you see Deus Volt or uh, God wills it, uh, and the reconquest reconquest of the West or the Great Replacement. Uh, this Great Replacement theory has been promoted by uh, uh, Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch shooter, people, other shooters in their manifestos in this country, uh, also in uh, in uh, uh, Scandinavia a few years ago, uh, and this this idea these people believe that there is an active plan to to replace white people with uh, either through immigration of of uh, Muslims and other minorities or uh, enough people that will eventually breed them out of existence. But they believe it's a conscious plan, usually promoted by Jews and and others. Uh, it was a little concerning to me because. Uh, I walked into my chiropractor's office last week and I happened to see a guy wearing this exact shirt here. Uh, so, uh, a lot of this material, as I said, is distributed over social media. We've been, we've been produ producing these reports, as uh, was said in the introduction. We've re produced 23 reports called Digital Terror and Hate, which I will show you how to access. And you see, you've got uh, you've got your traditional uh, uh, social media platforms here, many of which have 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 tried to take steps to deal with a lot of the extremism that's promoted on their platforms, but also have a lot of difficulty in do so in doing so. Uh, then you have gaming, which, as I said, has been a major uh, a major uh, recruiting tool. Uh, and some of the largest ones, like this one, represents Discord, uh, and this one over here on the left represents Steam, uh, uh, groups that have literally tens of millions of subscribers. Uh, Twitch, which is one that does live streaming and uses uses uh, shows people using uh, playing actually playing games and discussing them on video, and then people can view the videos. And we've seen some very disturbing material on there. Minecraft uh, is one of these constructor games, very popular with young people. Fortnite the same way uh, for years, and it may still be Fortnite was the number one game in the uh, in the world. Uh, Roblox, which I'm going to show you a couple of examples from. Uh, so all these are places where where people can be recruited and young people in particular. So. Then we have alternative platforms that have sprung up as YouTube and and uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, uh, wrestle with trying to uh, get the the extremist content off their off their platforms. What happens is that these alternative platforms have have emerged, and and we don't even have some of them on here. But uh, VK is a Russian social networking site that a lot of people. Have moved to when they get kicked off of Facebook. It looks very much, very much like Facebook. Omegle, a, a video site. There's another video site, BitChute. Uh, any of the videos that get get uh, bounced from YouTube, they usually end up here. Gab, which was created specifically for uh, extremists uh, during the 26 can 2016 campaign, and absolutely the worst site online today is uh is telegram uh and telegram has uh thousands and thousands of channels we monitor uh literally hundreds of those uh the worst material and the bulk of it is is on there on a daily basis uh and i'll show you i'll give you a url we re we've re produced a report uh talking about what's on telegram so uh at the end i'll, I'll give you that url so uh, one of the things that we do, we do a, we do a class uh, that we, we talk to kids about the perils of social media. And this is just one example. Uh, we do a poll in the class. And uh, this was, as you see, was compiled over uh, uh, about a year in 2019 and 2020. And we ask kids, how often do they see 
harmful content. Some said never, uh, but uh, over 60, over 70% basically said they see some harm, harmful contact, e content either daily or every week. That's very disturbing to us. And unfortunately, there's, there's so many sites out there and so many places that they can see that content. Uh, we also, when we do our annual report, we give a grade to the various social media companies. Uh, a lot of these are going to change in the next year, especially Facebook for all the things that have happened. And even though you hear ab about Facebook and there, there's, you know, been a lot of problems recently, they were actually the first ones to take hate online seriously and they assign people to it and policies and so forth. Getting them to live up to their policies is what we do when we meet with all these different com companies. So, uh, besides Telegram, the next worst one is probably TikTok. You know, all the all the kids use TikTok. Uh, this is Brenton Tarrant. You see that he's got uh, his he, his manifesto, the Great Replacement that I talked about here, uh, and then the sun wheel in the background and the. The handle on the TikTok account, 14 Muzzy Remover 88. Uh, uh, this is how blatant some of this material is, even on sites like TikTok. And we find we find a lot of this material there. Uh, just some of the examples from TikTok here cover the range from explosives, anti-Semitism, anti-LGBTQ, uh, you name it, it's you can find it on TikTok, unfortunately. Uh, Telegram, I mentioned, this is absolutely the, the worst site online. Just to give you a brief, uh, this, is, this is a list of feeds. These particular ones were related to, uh, to Adam Waffen and offshoots of Adam Waffen. And then each one, if you click on one of the feeds, you'll see the material over here on the right. Uh, and many of these are hyperlinked. They take you to other places. And if you subscribe to the feed, you'll get a daily... Uh, diet of this type of material. And unfortunately, as I said, there's there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of channels. It's it's never ending on Telegram. And because they're based in the UAE and don't want uh, you don't want any contact with anyone, there's absolutely no one to talk to about it, no regulation. And it's 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 hard to fathom what what if any rules they do have. Uh, one of the things that we see on Telegram is the deification of, of uh, shooters, uh, such as Brenton Tarrant from Christchurch, uh, or uh, John Ernest, who uh, 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 shot up the uh, Chabad Synagogue in San Diego County, uh, killed, killed one woman, and tried to live stream it, but wasn't too good at it, messed it up. Uh, just, and other shooters as well. This is Dylan Roof up here from the AME shooting in, in Charleston, South Carolina, and of course, uh, Hitler. So uh, they, they deify these, these uh, uh, shooters, and unfortunately, there's, there's always new ones that they can promote. Uh, this is uh, a, called the National Socialist Order, the Adam Waffen Division, which was pretty well shut down. A lot of other people went to jail. Uh, they reconstituted as the National Socialist Order, again, using the Tottenkopf there. Um, one of the places that's really disturbing to us is places like Spotify that have playlists uh, featuring, featuring Elliot Roger, TikTok also. We see a lot of material related to Elliot Roger. Well, who was he? He was a 22-year-old student at University of Santa Barbara murdered six people and wounded 14 through gunshots, stabbing, vehicle ramming. And he was known as an incel or involuntary celibate. He believed that there was actually a plot against young men like him that, that uh, so women would not give him any attention. Uh, and he released this uh, statement just before he committed his acts. Uh, and I uh, said, you know, never, none girls have never been attracted to me. I don't know why, uh, because I'm the supreme gentleman. So that playlist on Spotify was the Elliot Rogers supreme, supreme gentleman playlist. We also see a lot of other things on Spotify, such as things like this, uh, a playlist mocking, uh, making fun of Anne Frank, uh, 
And unfortunately, Spotify is a place where where many kids, uh, unlike us dinosaurs that still have iPods, these kids just put together a playlist on on Spotify and listen to those. Uh, one site I want to show you is from iFunny. This is supposedly a meme site of funny memes. Uh, this is a guy called Minnesota Nationalist. And you see, he says, well, if you want to get together and play in Minecraft, let me know. Uh, he, uh, we know he was a high school student because he uh, promoted, promoted his uh, diploma that he graduated high school. He wasn't very good about whiting out here because uh, we had a uh, very enterprising intern that found this, went to the school and actually identified this guy uh, based on this picture here. And it's a good thing that we did because he promoted uh, hateful memes and, and, and images such as this. Uh, but even more disturbing, you see on the, the uh, left here, these were magazines for his weapon that he, he uh, uh, painted on, Tyranny Remover, Brady Bill, uh, you know, 1994 assault weapons ban, et cetera. Who else post, uh, uh, painted their, their magazines like that? Brenton Tarrant, the uh, mosque shooter in, in New Zealand who, who killed 51 Muslims at two, two different mosques. Uh, so what we did when we saw this and we were able to identify him, we made sure that he got a visit from the FBI. Uh, the last thing I want to show you is Roblox. This is a gaming site relatively new that is targeting uh, kids generally 10, 11 to 13. You see the characters here. They're all like these squared off robot types, but it's a constructor game like Minecraft and some of the others. Well, this one was a uh, a reconstruction of the camp at Auschwitz. Uh, and even more disturbing is this one uh, was a reconstruction of a shooting where the, the character could go in and shoot people at a Jewish school. Uh, and this is a platform that is, as I said, targeting, you know, kids 10 to 10 to 13, essentially. Uh, fortunately, we have very good contacts with people at Roblox. Uh, we've had some Zoom meeting with them, and we, we notify them when we find things like this. So uh, we're doing, we to access our main report, Digital Terrorism and Hate, you can go to the website, or it looks better on an app if you can get it on an iPad or a tablet uh, at digitalhate.net. In uh, hopefully a week or so, we will be releasing this decoding hate, uh, which has a lot of the symbols and things that I've showed you here. Uh, and those can be accessed at Wiesenthal.com uh, slash SWC reports. And with that, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, and thanks to OJGDP for putting this uh, talk together and uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to go through this. So my name is James Densley, and I have uh, an opportunity here to sort of walk through the mechanisms behind youth hate crime. So thinking about how do people actually get radicalized into uh, hate violence and hate crime in the first place? And I just want to give a quick shout out to the National Institute of Justice, who uh, were responsible for the funding behind the research that myself and my uh, partner, Gillian Peterson, worked on with mass shootings in the United States and mass shooters. Uh, but also to acknowledge the fact that uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, our interpretation of that data, and it's not uh, the interpretation of the Department of Justice. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be speaking to a research project that we've been engaged in. Uh, we call it the Violence Project. Uh, it was a study of the life histories of mass shooters in the United States. And also uh, some related work where we've looked at the role of social media and how social media uh, radicalizes people into violence and into extremism. And so if you think about the way in which hate and hate violence operates, I think the most important thing to recognize is that it operates on multiple different levels, at different levels of explanation. So on the one hand, you have the micro or the individual level, 
And this is really something that psychologists in particular would focus on, thinking about what is it about the individual that might be setting them up to become more susceptible to radicalization and to violent behavior. So this might be certain mental health concerns, and it might be certain individual deficits that that person has that starts to get them going down that pathway toward violence. Now, at the same time, all of us as individuals are operating within a macro framework, big picture structural framework. So we cannot understand the individual pathway to violence without putting it in the bigger context. And I think the last two presentations have really done a great job of doing that, recognizing that none of this happens in isolation or in a vacuum, that this is happening at a time where we are seeing an increase in hate across the United States. It's happening with the rise of social media and social media platforms, with the way in which to some degree hate has become normalized within our society, that it's become mainstream because of the platforms that have enabled it to become so. And the tensions that we feel in our social media feeds and every time we switch on the television are part of that bigger macro structure, but so too are the challenges that might be mobilizing people into hate. So if you're thinking about why you're looking for answers to problems in life, that also might need to be put into that bigger structural framework. So sometimes the economy or the pandemic might also be part of the motivating factors that go and help people search for the answers that they're looking for on the internet, on some of the websites that uh, we were just uh, uh, looking at in the last presentation. And then finally, you have this kind of meso or what you might call the mid-range theory that would help us understand how people get involved in uh, in hate and in hate violence. What we mean by this are the group processes that occur when you start to engage with hate groups online, when you start to tumble down the rabbit hole on some of these social media sites, and where you start to interact with others that maybe validate some of the ideas that you have got. So in some of our previous work looking at the role of social media, one of the questions that we were interested in was to what extent is social media actually responsible for the radicalization of particularly young people into violence? And we took some learning from gang research to try and understand this phenomena theoretically. In the gang literature, there is this relationship between gang membership and violence. We know that gang members tend to be more involved in violence as victims and as an offenders versus non-gang members. And the question, of course, is why? What is it about gang membership that's important? Is it a selection bias, meaning the types of people who join gangs? Is it the gangs themselves and the group processes that facilitate the violence? Or is it a combination of both? Now, if you apply that same logic to social media and the internet, you can start to ask that same question. Is it that certain people are attracted to hate? Is it that people become radicalized in hate groups? Or is it a combination of both? And I think as you understand that the world is not black and white, that it is shades of gray, you find that it is a combination of both. There are certain risk factors there are certain uh, individual level issues that are driving people into these hate groups online. And then once they reach that space, it becomes a, a, a facilitation effect. And so combined, it's an enhancement process. So let's think about some of those mechanisms. What is it that's going on um, at the moment, at this time, particularly with the rise of social media and the internet? Now I'm sharing with you on this screen an excerpt in reference to a public opinion survey that was conducted in the 1960s. This is 1964. Now this is a nationally representative public opinion survey where people were asked a question over a telephone and they gave an answer. 
but they had no idea how many other people were answering the same way. And I want to flag for you that this was in 1964 that 7% of US adults agreed that Adolf Hitler was right to try and kill all the Jews. So even if you took that 7% and just said, what if that number was the same today? What if that number was 7% right here, right now in the United States? What has changed between 1964 and 2021? Well, one of the biggest things that's changed is the ability for that 7%, let's say if that's the case, to interact with one another, to mobilize, to find one another. For that 7% to recognize that they are part of a 7%. Because it could have been at that time a lonely space to have been a white supremacist and to have been a neo-Nazi. But in the current day and age, that 7% has the mechanism to be able to interact with one another. Because through the internet, they can find each other out and realize that they're part of something bigger. And it's that part of something bigger that mobilizes them to action. And in our research, in some cases, that includes mass shootings that claim the lives of multiple people. And in the previous presentation, there were a number of examples of those types of shootings which were shared. So if you think about not just the fact that the internet provides coordination for white supremacist groups and for the ideology behind hate, it also provides what you might call in the criminological literature differential association. Now that's really a fancy way of saying peer influence or peer pressure. But what you can say is that the internet has increased the exposure to online only associations. You're able to connect with people that you've never met with physically in real life, but you've connected with them uh, globally as a virtue of the internet. But what the internet also does is it enhances the frequency, duration, and intensity of our face-to-face -face communications. So for hate groups and individuals associated with them who are meeting in person, they not only have that kind of in-person communication tool, they now have the backstage planning that comes with social media. So there's the front stage work, which we just saw in the previous presentation, a lot of the imagery that's out there on the internet, but there's all the backstage planning and there's all the coordination and communication, and it can make it really hard to escape these types of hate groups. If you're embedded within them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because of the nature of the internet. This, in the gang research world, we might call group process. We think about the opportunity structure to be a part of a hate group or to be part of this ideology. The normative influence and the collective behaviors that then come with feeling part of something bigger. But of course, not all of us go searching to be part of this something bigger. So. Again, to take it back down a level to the individual, who are the people that are searching out these groups in the first place? Well, the thing about the social media uh, landscape is that it really can impact upon people's self-image. So the rise of the internet is not just a coordination tool for hate groups, but it's also giving people reason to go searching for them in the first place. You constantly have global reference groups. If you've ever thought you were good at anything, just Google it. And pretty soon you'll find that there's somebody else out there better than you. And we can see how social media and the internet has an impact, particularly on young people's self-esteem. It can make them feel less than. It can make them feel negative about their self-image. And this in turn can go and influence them to have to think, how do I make myself feel like I'm part of something else, part of something bigger? 
how do I find camaraderie? How do I find my place in the world? And so it's often those people who are searching for answers and searching for solutions to their problems that get radicalized and mobilized into these groups. Now, if you've ever spent any time on social media, you'll also know that it doesn't take long for social media to start to exacerbate our moral outrage. Um, social media is not really a healthy place to be spending a lot of time. And it's really easy to fixate on things on social media and to turn what could be a good day into a bad day very quickly. So if that happens to us and we are not being radicalized into hate groups, imagine what it's like when you spend your days in the darkest corners of the internet on some of the websites that were just shared in the previous presentation. It can start to create a sense that this is your world. Now, I want to stress something that's important here. Some recent research just found that Twitter, which we would think of being a really mainstream popular platform, only about 25% of Americans are even on Twitter. And of the 25% of Americans who are even on it, it's 25% of those users who are responsible for the vast majority of the content. So there's a selection bias and who's even communicating with you on a mainstream platform. But the numbers of likes and retweets and shares you get can give you a sense that you are part of something bigger and greater. So now if you extrapolate from that to some of these other websites like Gab and 4chan and, 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 the, and so on, where the selection bias is even greater, you can feel like you're part of something huge when really you're part of something very small. But it's that perception that can mobilize people to action and to violence. And then one other mechanism here is a concept in psychology known as social proof. Social proof is at, at times of uncertainty when we're unsure how to act and how to respond. We look to others for models of behavior. Now, if you think about it in terms of when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Now, if you're a young person who is struggling in life with depression or anxiety or just where to fit in and how to act and behave, you often go searching for models of behavior. And those models of behavior can at times connect you to something bigger and potentially something more violent. So in our research on mass shootings, for instance, we found a number of young people who were isolated and alone and frustrated and angry with their lot in life, who found solace and inspiration in the lives of other mass shooters, that they were looking for other people like them who had felt the way they feel about the world and were struggling with the same challenges that they were struggling with. And in the narratives of those mass shooters, in their manifestos and in their documents, they saw themselves. And so here is a quote from one of the individuals that we interviewed. This was a school shooter who will be incarcerated for the rest of their life, sharing that they were struggling in life and they were looking for ways to make sense of how they were feeling. And so they went looking on social media for answers. They went looking in the internet for answers. And the answers they found really for them galvanized the idea that the solution to their problem was to murder their classmates. We see online, as was shared in the previous presentation, uh, memes and, and deities and uh, celebrations of the actions of previous shooters that go on to mobilize and inspire others to move on. So we see this, for instance, with uh, the misogynistic incel or involuntary celibate movement, which has taken previous mass shooters and, and violent offenders as almost their patron saints, and then have in turn mimicked that type of behavior and have felt part of something bigger, uh, alluding to the idea that they are now joining the club and that others should follow suit. One of the things that was really quite 
powerful for us in the research that we did in the lives of mass shooters. We interviewed mass shooters who were incarcerated, but we also interviewed family members who knew them growing up. We also interviewed survivors, first responders, victims and others who could give us this sort of 360 degree view of this phenomena. But one of the things that really stuck with us came from a sibling of a mass shooter who said that this person who went on to perpetrate such horrific crime went from a stage of asking themselves, what is wrong with me? Why am I the one who feels the way that I feel like I don't belong, that people don't treat me with the respect and the deference that I feel I deserve? What is wrong with me? And then over time, there was a switch and it changed from what is wrong with me to what is wrong with them. And once you start to get that in group and out group dynamic, once you start to see that the target of your frustrations is somebody else, violence follows. And so it's that switch that we need to be attuned to, to recognize. How do we spot when somebody's got that feeling and when that switch is about to be switched? And so with that, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Gillian Peterson, who's going to follow up with uh, some of the solutions to addressing those dynamics that I've just been speaking about. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be covering that same sort of four year research project that James was just talking about, but really focused on some of the conclusions from that work and what it really means when we think about tangible prevention strategies, particularly um, in schools. So we know that mass shootings, school shootings, a horrific form of hate crime has been on the rise for the last 20 years with the worst years on record being 2017, 18 and 19. So when we look at sort of what are the common factors we see, and this is when we look at a group of about 200 mass shooters since 1966, people who killed four or more people in a public space. One of the first big findings is that shooters who do this are insiders. They are not outside monsters that come from nowhere. They are employees of the workplace. They are students at the college. They are students at K through 12 schools. They're students and employees that we are interacting with and seeing every single day. We also found that perpetrators are in crisis. Um, and we define a crisis as when your circumstances overwhelm your ability to cope and it's a marked change in your behavior from baseline. So something is different. And we interviewed tons of people who knew perpetrators of mass shootings. And this was really consistent that there, there was a change in behavior. Something was different, whether that was increased agitation, abusive, isolation, mood swings. It was over 80% of the time people could look and say, yes, I knew something was different, but I would never have guessed it was this. The third thing we found is that mass shooters are suicidal. Um, and as a psychologist, I was really interested in what is that pathway to violence, this form of violence look like? What does that build look like? And what are the mental health risk factors? And we found that individuals who do this sort of crime, 30 were actively, 30% were actively suicidal prior to the attack, 40% um, killed themselves during the attack that these shootings were meant to really be their final act. Nobody had an escape plan. This was a way to get their grievance and their hate out to the world so that people watched it. And they also planned to sort of go down with that act. We found that perpetrators study other shooters. So about a quarter planned significantly in advance. This is particularly true for young shooters and school shooters. A lot of them, like James mentioned, show an interest in past mass shootings and study other mass shooters. And about a quarter of them leave behind something that we call a legacy token. So a video or a manifesto, something to leave behind that is passed on after their shooting and after they die that people read and they think about and they can kind of get that hateful message out to the world in a way that they couldn't do it in their own lives. There's this quest for notoriety in these acts of wanting to be seen and witnessed. 
Shooters also leak their plans. So leakage is the term where people give some sort of indication prior to the attack, whether that's in writing or telling someone, whether that's specific or kind of a more general non-specific violent threat. But in school shootings, 78% of perpetrators leak their plans ahead of time. And this is mostly to their peers. We had school shootings we studied where 50 other kids in the school knew it was going to happen and nobody reported. And we recently published a paper in JAMA that just came out a few weeks ago that found that that leakage was really associated with prior counseling and with suicidality. So sometimes we think of leakage as maybe wanting attention or fame seeking, but we really found in our research that it was really a crime for help, a cry for help and a really sort of important intervention point for schools. So looking in particular at school mass shooters, we see that they are current or former students of the school, 91% of the time, that they are in a noticeable crisis nearly 90% of the time, that they are actively suicidal prior to the shooting about 80% of the time, and about 80% of the time, they're leaking their plans ahead of time. So we can really use this data and these findings to think about what might effective intervention and prevention look like. We can also use those findings to think about kind of the limitations of what we're currently doing. So the fact that school shooters are insiders means that things like hard security, bulletproof doors, um, running through lockdown drills, all of those things are really focused on an outsider threat, somebody coming into the building who's not a part of that community. Insider threats are trickier because the most likely person to commit violence is running through those drills along with everybody else and moving in and out of that security. The fact that school shooters are in crisis means that when we identify students who are maybe leaking their plans, who are threatening something, our typical response um, as law enforcement or as schools is to kind of punish or exclude that student. So either suspension, expulsion, criminal charges for terroristic threats, all of those responses really exacerbate the crisis. They intensify the grievance and the hate and the outgroup feeling and might actually increase the risk of violence rather than decrease it. The fact that school shooters are actively suicidal has some implications when thinking about kind of armed officers in schools. We published another paper in JAMA that found that the presence of an armed officer actually increased the number of casualties in a school shooting. And the reason we think that is, is because we interviewed perpetrators who said, I went to the school with a plan to be shot by the police, that that armed officer was actually a part of their plan. We know that since shooters study other shooters that we really need to, as schools and institutions, be plugged into what students are doing in their online worlds um, outside of the school environment. And we also know that with so many um, school shooters leaking their plans ahead of time that we have to create systems where young people feel comfortable reporting to adults and trust the response that adults are going to have. This was the model that we kind of put together in looking at mass shooters lives and build towards violence over time. So, first of all, mass shooters tended to have a history of really significant trauma whether that was physical abuse, sexual abuse, really pervasive early childhood trauma, that built to that crisis point, um, which was often a suicidal crisis point. James talked about this social proof piece. So looking at other shooters, studying other shooters and seeing themselves in those shooters. And then finally, there's the opportunity, which is typically access to weapons and access to the people and places they wanna target, which for school shooters is typically the school. So we can think about prevention at each of these points. We tend to in schools really focus on that last piece, that opportunity piece, but there's things we can be doing to think about intervention at trauma, crisis, and social proof. So these are just sort of examples I'll get into a bit more later, but um, for trauma, things like focusing on really warm, welcoming environments, emphasizing social emotional learning. I know another 
presentation mentioned anti-bullying, anything we can do to build those strong relationships between students and adults in this school, and especially social emotional learning for young boys who have been through significant trauma. Um, building crisis response teams and training all the adults in the building on how to respond to a student in crisis and having those protocols and those responses in place. For proof, we can think about teaching kids media literacy and how to kind of know what they're looking at online and what the risk factors are, and also building anonymous reporting systems for students to report when they're worried about a peer. And then finally, when we think about access, we know that school shooters tend to use guns that they take from their family members, either families or friends, because they're too young to purchase them on their own. So safe storage campaigns, and then also curbing the use of drills for students. I think we, we know it's very important to drill all of the adults in the school and have them know how to respond in a worst case scenario, but drilling students again and again and again can not only sort of show potential shooters how the school is going to respond, but can also start to build that social script for violence. So we launched this website called Off Ramps um, last year, which is a hub of resources and training and policy. So it does have videos, kind of two hour certification that really focus on building skills in suicide prevention, crisis intervention, crisis response teams, media literacy. It has a number of different resources organized by state focused on free mental health care and crisis response teams. And then it has a number of policies that are supported by the data and the research that we've done. One of the things on that website is this crisis response team protocol that we build um, called the R model, which stands for ready, respond, revert, and revisit. It's all free to download. It has kind of downloadable forms to think about how do you build a crisis response team? Who should be involved? How do you train people in the school to use it? And the violence project is certainly around as a resource to help schools kind of think through building those models and what that can look like. But we know it's critically important for every person, every adult in the school to know how to do crisis intervention. We talked to a principal at one school who said, you know, I wouldn't want my shop teacher doing suicide prevention. And I sort of said, you absolutely want your shop teacher to be able to do suicide prevention because if that's the person that students feel safe with and that's the person they're disclosing to, they have to know kind of how to respond and what to say and do. And we know that student mental health during this pandemic has been kind of at all time lows and increases in suicidality and depression and anxiety and isolation, all which can increase the risk for violence. Um, there's a lot of great media literacy um, sort of products or packages out there. We have some resources on that off ramp site but really teaching kids at a really young age to think about who created content, why they created it, who the message is for, what details were left out and sort of how they feel in response to that. We also have resources on that website focused on creating individualized plans of support. So I think we tend to, when students are threatening violence or saying hateful things, we tend to go towards those punitive responses, but really thinking about what are the root causes of where this is coming from and how can we really get in and address those? Because it's not a problem that we can really punish our way out of. So thinking about everything from mediation and mentoring, counseling, social services, peer support, and then talking to parents about safe storage of weapons. And one thing I think we're quite passionate about the violence project is that there's no one solution. It's not that we can just do this one thing and we'll solve the problems of youth hate crimes or we'll solve the problems of mass shootings. What we do know is there's a number of solutions supported by the data and research that if you start layering them on top of each other, I think we will have a real impact. And we can think about those as things we can do as individuals, as things we can do within our institutions, and then things we can do at the broader society. So for individuals, things like building relationships and mentoring young people, developing our own skills in crisis intervention and suicide prevention, monitoring our own media consumption and storing our weapons safely. At institutions, things like those warm welcoming environments, trauma informed practices, 
universal trauma screening, um, building crisis response teams, reducing drills, and things like anonymous reporting systems. And then at the broader level, um, requiring social emotional learning in schools, building stronger social safety nets, and increasing access to high quality treatment we know is important. Also, it was mentioned holding social media companies more accountable, and then some things like red flag laws, which can make it harder for people to access weapons when they're in crisis. And we really see all of these things as having a diffusion of benefits. So all of these policies may prevent mass shootings, may prevent other forms of hate crimes and hate violence, may prevent self-harm and suicidality or drug use, um, that these practices are really about focusing on young people's mental wellness, which that is, we know, kind of the root of um, sort of violence prevention and holistic violence prevention. So this is um, our book, The Violence Project, where we really go in depth into all of those interviews and all of this data and sort of all of these solutions, um, our two websites, and then how to contact us. And we're happy to sort of answer individual questions that way as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to our presenters. Uh, those were really, really great presentations. We have a few minutes for question and answers, so um, I'll get started with a couple of questions. Uh, one question uh, for you all is, have you seen an increase in the prevalence of cyberbullying during the last 18 months of the pandemic among school-aged adolescents? Um, it, it's hard to measure those things and i think the very first presentation from michael really spoke to that with the fbi data and other things but we are certainly hearing from schools and from practitioners that we're working with that they have seen a rise in uh, cyberbullying uh, and issues going on and i think part of it is a byproduct of the fact that people are just spending more and more time online um, our, our lives have moved online um, but also as well, all the ways in which uh, the pandemic has exacerbated risk factors. And I think one of the things that we have been seeing using data in partnership with the K-12 school shooting database is a rise in school violence in general, particularly school shootings. And we see it as a, uh, an extension of the rising violence, gun violence in our communities across the United States. We've seen rising homicide rates. We've seen rising shootings uh, in our communities. And this all seems to be tied to this kind of uh, dynamic at the moment of the economic instability of the pandemic, the emotional impact of the pandemic, rising gun sales during the pandemic, which were also a byproduct of fear. People buy guns when they're afraid. And the pandemic really spoke to that. So you put all those layers on top of each other, um, plus the time spent online. And, and we are seeing a, an increase in threats of violence at school and incidences of school shootings. Uh, they're not big mass shootings that are grabbing the headlines. It's everyday gun violence. And it's creeping into our schools at an alarming rate. And, and that's definitely something that we've been noticing in, in the research that we've been doing, uh, like I said, in partnership, the violence project with the K-12 school shooting database at the Naval uh, Postgraduate School. Thank you for answering that, James. Um, Rick, I think this question's for you. How should schools treat hate symbolism that may have multiple meanings? including non-biased, non-hate motivated, for example, the OK symbol or some of the symbols you mentioned that can have double meaning. Yeah, I, I think, let me just add on the other thing. We've seen a, we've seen a, a definite increase of online hate promotion, especially with COVID, blaming for COVID, et cetera. Uh, uh, but on that question, it's, it's something that really has to be taken taken a school by school. And I think the best way to deal with that is to contact somebody and talk to them, either ourselves or Southern Poverty Law Center or uh, so forth, because we there are resources out there, depending on what the situation is. We have formers that can talk to students or talk to administrators uh, on how to deal with, with some of these things, understanding some of these things, how to deal with, with somebody who might be be putting up these symbols 
Uh, unfortunately, the dual symbols, you don't, so many of them are, are pretty esoteric. They're, somebody that's putting up one of those symbols, like a Celtic cross or uh, a Thor's hammer or some of the others, it's not likely they're doing it. Uh, be, they're probably motivated by some form of hate. It's not likely that they're putting, you know, doing one of those uh, for some other reason. Uh, but there's a lot of resources out there that that uh, we can provide to schools, and especially with Zoom these days, we can bring in a former or, uh, you know, even make a former available to speak at assemblies or things like that. I, I think it, it depends on the, the depth of the school's problem and, and uh, how aggressively they want to they, treat it, but there are things that we can do. Thank you, Rick. Well, um, we've run out of time, but I really want to say thank you again uh, to our presenters and to the audience for being with us today. Um, OJJDP's next webinar is going to be on December 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and it's titled Creating a Safe School Environment for Youth Part 1, uh, Strategies and Solutions, and we hope to see you there. Um, this has been a great discussion. Thank you all again for all of your great content. Uh, OJJP really appreciates it, and um, I hope you have a, everyone has a great rest of their afternoon. Thank you so much, Steffi, and thank you to all of our panelists for today. Again, we appreciate the great information and knowledge that you all have provided in the round um, preventing youth hate crimes and uh, hate groups. Um, so, the uh, to wrap us up, just really quickly to remind everyone that we will. You will receive a automated email with a certificate of attendance. When you receive that certificate, please note that we will um, it will include your information, your name, and just uh, saying thank you for attending um, today's web event. Uh, in the uh, email you'll receive, you will receive a link where you'll be able to provide us some feedback. My uh, co-host uh, Alicia Lord will be posting a link. Uh, please. Click on that link and provide feedback um, at your earliest. Um, also, if you'd like to get in contact with NTAC, here's our information where we can be uh, reached. If you would like to get in contact with OJJDP uh, via the help desk uh, or learn about Juve Just or any upcoming events, please note that we have um, that information here as well. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Please be sure to submit your request via the OJJDP TTA 360 um, platform. The URL for that platform is located here. Uh, please note that webinars, again, are located on OJJDP's multimedia page. If you would like to receive any of the supporting materials, please be sure to contact the OJJDP TTA help desk and we can get those items over to you. Nope, sorry, it's. Freezing on me here. <laughs> oh, the poll is closing there. Um, and thank you all for uh, uh, doing that poll. Please note the uh, disclaimer and attribution here. And then finally, please note we also have a few uh, poll questions before everyone leaves uh, that we would like to get a few uh, some information here. So note that um, the next poll that I'm opening up for folks, we want you all to know if you can indicate to what extent you wish to. Um, that you agree with the statement here. So please take a moment to complete this poll uh, where you're indicating uh, the extent to which you will be, uh, excuse me, the extent to which uh, you agree or disagree with the statement there. I'll leave that up for just a couple of seconds here. Okay. Thank you all for completing that. So I'll go ahead and close that poll out and uh, feel free to continue to complete that for the next 20 seconds. Again, thank you all for submitting that information. It'll close in the next 10 seconds here. And again, this is helping us to gather uh, much needed information for us to make sure that we better uh, <clears throat> do our uh, webinars in the series. Uh, the next poll here um, that we would like to have is uh, the agreements of useful information. And so that poll should be opening up shortly. 
And again, we want you to let us know how you agree or disagree with this statement that the information from this webinar is useful to your work. And please take a moment to complete this poll. I'll give everyone about another 20 seconds or so. Please indicate um, how the information from this webinar, if it's useful to your work that you do. All right, I'll go ahead and close this poll out. Thank you all for submitting that information there. This poll will close in about 20 seconds. Okay. Thank you all for submitting those responses. And then we have one final poll here um, at the very end. And we would like you all to provide, um, let's see, a couple of suggestions for us. So in this poll, we basically want to know um, what suggestions do you have for improving the content facilitation and format of this webinar uh, in the future? Feel free to type your answer uh, there. If you're unable to type your answer, please note that you can provide any feedback in the chat. Be sure to send it to all panelists before you hit enter, uh, but go ahead and take a moment to definitely type to us and let us know uh, what suggestions do you have for improving content facilitation and format of this webinar in the future. While you are completing that poll, just again, another reminder to everyone, please be sure to join us for the upcoming uh, what we we have on December 16th, the second uh, webinar uh, that we have, uh, Strategies and Solutions, uh, this uh, creating a safe school and community environment for youth, uh, part one strategies and solutions. This will be held on Thursday, December 16th at the same time, 2 p.m. Uh, to 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. So please be sure to register for that web event. And as always, connect with OJJDP if you would like to have more information or stay up on the latest and greatest from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll. Again, thank our panelists, our presenters, our moderator for a great webinar. Everyone take care and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us.